Okay, scurvy checkers. I don't know, what was, the, what was the news? Did anybody have any like teeth falling out, blackened joints? Everybody, everybody's safe with the citrus? <laughs> All right, for our final speaker of the evening, I'd like to welcome Chris Carrico to the stage to talk a little bit about the, the medical science of scurvy, but uh, also how we've been really bad at it. Please welcome Chris. It's not a legendary whale dick, but I do, I'll do what I can. And, and we're back. All right. Hi, everyone. Maybe you've heard of scurvy before. Probably all of you here have heard of scurvy before. We're at a nautical-themed event. Scurvy begins with some fairly common problems. You're tired. You feel like shit. Your arms and legs are sore. What distinguishes it from... I partied too hard on the dance floor last night, I went too hard on leg day, is when it starts to turn into things like bone pain, gum diseases, let's face it, also fairly normal, skin bruising, also normal depending on your hobbies, but when your teeth start to become loose and it's not that nightmare thing where you're checking them over, but they're actually maybe starting to come out, that's a, a, you should get that checked out, that's a problem. Um, and then if you start having uh, particular things like your wounds reopening from years ago, that's probably not a curse. You need to go do something about that and like see a, a doctor. And people have known about this for a really long time. I mean, this, this is not a recent picture here on the, I guess, your right. Um, and uh, the, the first recorded source on scurvy that I'm aware of is from a guy named Hippocrates, who you might uh, know about because of his influence on the medical profession who recorded some fairly common sense prescriptions and descriptions of scurvy back in like 1500 BC, he said particularly it affects sailors, soldiers, other people who don't have access to fresh food. So I don't know, maybe eat some fresh food. <laughs> Problem solved. Except in the 1700s age of sail period that Annette has been talking about and we've all been talking about all evening, this became more and more of a problem. Uh, the painting here is from a voyage of this Commodore, George Anson, who managed to lose 1,500 out of 1,900 sailors on his circumnavigation of the globe to scurvy. That's a lot. So these, these amazing new ships people built meant that they made all kinds of really bad life choices, like joining up with this guy. And it was not uncommon to have half of a crew die of scurvy on a, a journey. This is, these are also the same people that brought us insurance because the, the things got fucked up so, so often. <laughs> not, not, I mean, a joke, but also not a joke. Um, and uh, correspondingly, as, as most major scientific developments from this period uh, happened, uh, this turned into people trying to solve it for the British government to make more money off the colonies. So on the left, we have this doctor from, uh, from England named John Woodall, who also basically said, yeah, but have you tried eating fresh food? Um, and in particular, this led to things like people like going to citrus plantations in the Caribbean on the other side of the journey, restocking with you know, fresh food and coming back. They didn't know citrus in particular was like good for this. It was just kind of a, a lucky guess. Um, but then this guy on the right, James Lind, launched the, the first randomized controlled clinical trial in, in recorded history that I'm aware of at least. We took a group of sailors that were recovering from scurvy, divided them to six groups, and then treated them. So group one got like cider, right? A common folk remedy for scurvy. Group two drank dilute sulfuric acid. So yeah, that's, that's a lead acid battery. I don't think there was lead involved. Science. Group three got vinegar. Group four got a spicy paste. <laughs> group five got seawater and group six got oranges and lemons. And I'll let you guess which one of these worked best. That's right. It's battery acid. <laughs> and so after this, the, the, the British Navy, right? And then the Dutch East India Company, Dutch West India Company, etc., really started doing organized planting of citrus fruit so that they would always have supplies ready, right? And the reason why this is such a technological development is everyone knew that fresh food helped with scurvy. The sailors knew it, everyone knew it. But when you're packing for this like months long ocean journey, finding fruit that's gonna keep for a long time and is an efficient way to store what, well, vitamin C, but they didn't know that at the time, 
that whatever cures scurvy is like a, a big problem. And that led to other logistical problems. The most interesting tangent I found in this talk is that one of the best places to grow citrus fruit in Europe is Sicily. And then if you have the British buying all this shit up and the Spanish with the gold they're bringing back from you know, Mexico, sorry, Mexico, um, then it winds up being an attractive target for theft. So you start having these peasants form these protection societies to act as basically securities for these citrus trees because it'd be a shame if something unfortunate happened to it. And then a couple centuries later, you get this nice Italian grandpa coming over with his like, you know, prized citrus orchard and uh, uh, extending his family business in the East Coast. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, and so we basically had this like pretty well-established kind of early industrial system for preventing scurvy on these sailing ship journeys, right? And as ships got faster, as people developed steam engines, it became less important. You could make the journey faster. It really takes scurvy like a month to kick in. So once you can cross the ocean in two weeks, you can kind of do whatever you want. It's going to be fine. Um, which leads us to the, the more modern medical disaster at this talk. So this is a, a polar explorer named Robin, Robert Falcon Scott, who put together an expedition known as the Terra Nova Expedition to be the first person to reach the South Pole. Um, the South Pole sucks. It's, uh, it's on a giant 8,000 foot tall plateau in the middle of the worst continent. And uh, Robert F. Scott, plan for this in very British style with like hyper organizing the absolute shit out of everything. He had ponies, he had steam powered sleds, he had uh, the latest and scientifically prepared canned food, he had ships on both sides of the continent so that they could launch from one of them over winter in his extremely well appointed cabin and then make it through in the, the Antarctic summer to the other side of the continent to the other ship that they had waiting there, right? Everything's planned out. And so here's a, a photo of them when they actually did make it to the South Pole, and they look uh, rough. Um, and I think this is one of the last photos of Robert F. Scott's expedition because they never made it to the other side. And in particular, uh, they, they died of large part scurvy uh, because it turns out when you can all of your food, you cook the shit out of it, and then all the vitamin C is gone. So they're scientifically prepared, like, hey, we've solved the botulism problem, which is great, right? Um, managed to wreck them. And this, this is something that intersects a lot with the, the, the citrus thing, too, because it turns out, like, copper, for example, uh, catalytically inactivates vitamin C, which is a fancy way of saying it burns through it really fast. So uh, the British Navy would do things like cook uh, uh, lime juice for all the sailors in vitamin C in the later part of the, the 19th century. And since they were using steamships to cross the ocean really fast, it never really registered that this is going to not be a good solution to the whole scurvy problem anymore. And it's not until you try to uh, uh, cross a continent by sled um, that this really becomes a problem. And these guys had problems like, oh, my war wound from 10 years ago is magically reopening and bleeding. And oh, my teeth are falling out. That's bad. So in the last couple of weeks of their lives, they knew they had scurvy, but they also couldn't keep walking over the uh, high altitude polar plateau. <laughs> so they held up in a tent, hoped that the rescue party would find them, which it didn't. Womp womp. Uh, what's even more womp womp is that the Norwegians who beat them to the pole by a few months had a way of solving this problem. As the leader of their expedition said, you can feed dogs dog, but you can't feed ponies pony. And it turns out you can also feed Norwegians dog. And so they managed to keep a supply of fresh meat the whole way across the continent on dog sleds, where they start with a lot of dogs. And by the time they finish on skis, they don't have any left. Boo fucking hiss. What makes this even more tragic, the whole, like, honestly, I kind of feel worse about the dogs, but I guess the humans dying exploring is bad too, uh, is that shortly after this, right, people developed refrigeration, which made it possible to keep food fresh for a much longer period of time and really prevents this whole problem. And then shortly after that, uh, this guy, Albert St. Georgia, uh, discovers vitamin C. This guy, as a side tangent, by the way, was awesome. 
Uh, he donated his Nobel Prize money to, to Finland to fight Stalin, and then was in the Hungarian resistance, had to hide from the Nazis, emigrated to the US, and then protested us during the Vietnam War. So triple A plus for him. And uh, the, the, the upshot of all this is that any system that you have for solving a problem, right, depends on the context you're solving the problem in. If you manage to, to voyage far enough away from what you're familiar with, you're going to run into problems that you hadn't anticipated because the systems that did work before are now not quite going to work so hot anymore, like your uh, cooked down lime juice and your grog. Um, and so although we still uh, manage to put ourselves in situations that tax the upper limits of human metabolism, right, people are actively researching these ways to continue applying the old solutions to new problems. And uh, I think that the take home message here for me, other than really rethink your assumptions when you go out into, I don't know, like a big dry lake bed for family camping adventure, <laughs> to go do bad ideas on purpose, which we've all, we've all been there is to eat your fucking vegetables. Yeah.